Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about nephrotic syndrome and focus on the pathophysiology. So nephrotic syndrome uh, presents as a tetrad of manifestations. Um, and this tetrad is proteinuria uh, greater than 3.5 grams in 24 hours, dyslipidemia, more specifically hypercholesterolemia, the third is hypoalbuminemia, and the last is peripheral edema or edema. So let us look at the pathophysiology and see how this tetrad uh, occurs. So here is a nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. Here is the afferent arterial coming into the head of the nephron and forms the glomerulus within the head of the nephron. Coming out is the efferent arterial, which eventually joins with other efferent arterioles to form the renal vein. And then the renal vein, vein will enter circulation once again. In nephrotic syndrome, for many reasons, which won't be discussed in detail here, there is inflammation and damage to the glomerulus. This inflammation and damage can be from immune cells, antibodies, complement proteins, immune complexes, hypertension, and sclerosis. Whatever the cause, it results in damage and inflammation specifically to cells called podocytes, which normally help prevent protein loss. So podocytes are damaged within the glomerulus, and this damage will allow proteins to pass through into the nephron's tubule. And remember, this usually should not happen. And so the protein travels through the nephron's tubule and will be part of urine. And nephrotic syndrome is characterized by protein loss of more than 3.5 grams in 24 hours. This loss of protein results in mass proteinuria with or without hematuria, which is blood in urine. And this hematuria will essentially depend on how much damage occurs to the glomerulus. The protein loss can also be antibodies that is lost because antibodies are proteins as well. So if there is loss of antibodies, the person doesn't have their normal antibody defense mechanism. And so this means that they are at increased risk of infection. The mass loss of protein, such as albumin, from the circulation results in hypoproteinemia, more specifically hypoalbuminemia, so less protein, less albumin in the blood. And this will tell the liver to produce more proteins to compensate. And so the liver works on overdrive producing not only proteins such as albumin, but the liver will also produce cholesterol. The cholesterol is not necessary, but occurs anyway, resulting in hypercholesterolemia. Now, the hypoproteinemia or the hypoalbuminemia also results in a reduced plasma oncotic pressure. A reduced oncotic pressure means that water and the electrolytes will actually move into the interstitium. So they will move from circulation into the interstitium. This occurs because of oncotic pressure. There are no solutes, there are no proteins in the vascular compartment to hold the water and the electrolytes. And so the water and the electrolytes will move to the interstitium. And this will result in peripheral edema, which causes swelling of the feet, for example. Now, the movement of water and electrolytes means that there will be a decrease in volume in the vascular compartment. There will be decrease uh, of volume in the circulation. This decrease in volume means that there will be a decrease in volume uh, returning to the heart. So there will be a decrease in venous return to the heart. With a decrease in blood volume returning to the heart, this means that the heart will also be pumping less volume to the rest of the body. 
What does this mean? Well, this means that there will be a decrease in renal blood flow, which means a decrease in GFR. The GFR stands for the glomerular filtration rate, and it's essentially the rate at which the kidneys, the nephrons, filter um, circulation. Now, the inflammation that is occurring in the kidneys already will also contribute to a decrease in GFR. So when you have a decrease in GFR, when you have a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate and the blood flow, this will actually stimulate some cells at the head of the nephron to produce a molecule called renin. Renin is important and it will activate what is known as the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The function of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is to essentially increase blood pressure to compensate for the decrease in vascular volume and the decrease in GFR. One way the renin angiotensin aldosterone system um, does increase blood pressure is by retaining sodium and thus retaining water from the kidneys to maintain uh, it in the vascular space. However, this will eventually result in further edema because of the hypoproteinemia that is already occurring, remember. So in summary, we just saw how proteinuria occurs due to inflammation in the glomerulus. And this will eventually lead to hypoalbuminemia, hypercholesterolemia, and peripheral edema. And this is the tetrad seen in nephrotic syndrome. Based on this tetrad, we can expect to possibly see some signs and symptoms. So for the dyslipidemia, the hypercholesterolemia, we can see xanthalesma, which is deposits of cholesterol around the eye, and xanthomata. Hypoalbuminemia will result in tiredness and leukonychia striata, which is essentially the uh, changes occurring along the nail bed. Hypo Albuminemia also results in edema because of the reduced oncotic pressure. Edema can be periorbital edema, which is uh, fluid around the eye. It can be ascites, fluid in the abdomen, and also peripheral edema of the lower limb. Patients with nephrotic syndrome can be breathless because of fluid edema, because of the fluid overload, or pleural effusion. Urine in nephrotic syndrome is often described as being frothy in appearance. So next is investigations. Now, there are many, many causes of nephrotic syndrome, and these causes will be discussed on a separate video, which will, which will look at the different types of nephrotic syndrome. But some common causes of nephrotic syndrome include diabetic nephropathy. There are certain connective tissue diseases, and some autoimmune immunological problems that attack the kidneys. So the investigations that are performed is to assess severity, is to diagnose nephrotic syndrome, and to uh, differentiate the different types of nephrotic syndrome. So investigations can include urine dipstick, MSU, full blood count, EUCs, liver function test, LFTs, calcium levels, CRP and glucose, serum and urine immunoglobulins is important to screen for autoimmune diseases, and also to check for presence of immune response to uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, which are also some causes of nephrotic syndrome. Chest x-rays can be performed and may show pleural effusion or edema. Other important investigations include ultrasound of the kidneys. Renal biopsy is important to look at the macro and micro changes seen in glomerular nephritis and to distinguish between the different types of nephrotic syndrome. In renal biopsy, 
you take a sample of the kidney tissue, usually ultrasound guided. After renal biopsy is taken, three things are checked. First, light microscopy, which looks at the general change in the kidney tissue, particularly the head of the nephron, where the glomerulus is. Two, immunofluorescence. Here, they expose the kidney tissue with specific things that will bind to antigens, immune complexes, and immunoglobulins in that tissue. Once they, exp once they expose the biopsy with these tags, it will light up with um, immunofluorescency. And this will tell the person if there is or there isn't presence of those things they were looking for. Number three, finally there is electron microscopy, which looks at the detailed architecture of the glomerulus, specifically the membrane of the glomerulus, where the problems might be occurring. Finally, the management of nephrotic syndrome depends on what the type is, and it won't be discussed in this video. Thank you for watching.